Genesis chapter 1, verse 24. I gave you Wednesday night the business about uh, the great fish and the whales and the worms. But we're going to go to verse 24 this week. And we'll read 24 and 25. And God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing, and beast of the earth after his kind. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth after his kind, and cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. All right, I want to just bring to you something here tonight uh, on this living creature, the living creature in verse 24. It says that God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature. And so I kind of want to uh, give you a sermon, I guess, or a study on this business about the living creature. Uh, because as a Christian, you're a new creature in Christ. Uh, you are a living creature now that you're saved. Uh, before you got saved, you were a dead creature. Amen? Amen. Uh, but when you got quickened, when you got born again, you became a living a creature. And that's what's happening here in verse 24. Now some say, and I don't, you know, I don't care how you look at it or not, uh, but between the, between the fifth and the sixth day is when the living creature was made. Between the fifth and the sixth day. So if it was on the fifth day, it would have been when he made those animals in the water there. And if it was on the sixth day, that's when God made man. And either one will fit. Either, either one will fit. Uh, because clearly the Lord made creature uh, creatures on uh, the fifth day. You'll get that um, there in verse 20. And his Bible says, let the waters break forth abundantly. The moving creature that hath life. You'll see that there. And, uh, and of course, man... We are creatures. We are creatures of habit, but we are creatures. And when you get born again, you become a new creature. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. Now here's an interesting Bible study part of this. The phrase living creature or creatures is found 23 times in your King James Bible. Now the living creature refers to all fish in the sea, the fowls in the heaven, the cattle, the beast, and the creeping things upon the earth. It also refers to mankind according to Genesis chapter 9. Go over there, Genesis chapter 9. That a living creature can refer to animals, but also humans. That's why I say it could be that God made these living creatures on the fifth day or the sixth day. If you're down at uh, PBI, they'll teach you it was made on the fifth day. Uh, if you're probably some other school somewhere, they'll teach you it was on the sixth day. But uh, regardless of the fact... Uh, a living creature is found to be both animals, but also humans. Genesis chapter 9, this is one of those places where it's referred to. Look at verse number 10. Coming off the ark, Genesis chapter 9 and verse number 10. And with every living creature that is with you, of the fowl, of the cattle, and of every beast of the earth with you, from all that go out of the ark to every beast of the earth, and I will establish uh, my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood. Neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the token of the covenant, which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I do set my bow in the cloud, rainbow that is, and it shall be a token for a covenant between me and the earth. And uh, it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth that the, bow, that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. Notice that, all flesh. And the waters shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the bow shall be in the cloud. And I will look upon it that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and and every living creature of what? All flesh that is upon the earth. So whether you're a bird, whether you're a beast, whether you're a, a, a sea monster in the sea, or a human being, all creatures here below are living creatures. Amen? And so when you're, when you're thinking about living creatures, I don't want you to leave yourself out of it. It's just a lot of times people don't want to refer to themselves as something less than what they think they are. Yeah, yeah. If they think that they are a creature, then that somehow, that somehow makes them 
less than human. And of course, in man's eyes, man is the pinnacle of evolution. You know. <laughs> All of these creatures are represented by other living creatures. Look at Ezekiel chapter 1. All living creatures here on earth are represented by other living creatures. Ezekiel chapter number 1. And look at verse 20. Ezekiel 1 20. God patterns things on heaven, uh, things on earth after things in heaven. Okay? So look at Ezekiel chapter 1 and look at uh, verse 5. And also out of the midst of thereof came the likeness of what? Four living, Four living creatures. And their appearance was the appearance, and this was their appearance, they had the likeness of a what? Amen. So they have a likeness of a man. Why? Because they're living creatures and man's a living creature. Yeah, yeah. Alright? And every one of these living creatures had four faces. And every one had four wings. And their feet were straight feet and the sole of their feet was like the sole of a calf's foot. And they sparkled like the color of burnished brass. Uh, come all the way down to verse number tw uh, 19. <laughs> and when the living creatures went, the wheels went by them. And when the living creatures were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up. Where the, where the spirit was to go, they went. So what do living creatures have? They have a spirit. Yes. Yes. You see that? Yes. Guess what you have? A spirit. a spirit. You have a body, you have a soul, and you have a spirit. These living creatures are said to have... Uh, spirits, look at verse number uh, 10. As for the likeness of their faces, they four had the face of a man, there's your living creature, the face of a lion, there's your living creature, on the right side, and they had the face of an ox, there's your living creature, on the left side, they also had the face of an eagle, there's your living creature. All things represented by the living creatures of Genesis chapter 1, except one living creature is missing. What is it? It's the water one, the fish, right? So that aquatic living creature is left off the list. Possibly the cherubs had a fifth face, which would have been the faith of a sea creature, which is why Satan is called what? Leviathan. Leviathan. What is Leviathan? A great big fish, a sea monster, a sea creature. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so on the fifth day, God made... The sea monster, God made the sea, the fish of the sea on the fifth day, which would be the fifth phase of that chair. That's just, you know, some Jeff opinion, not necessarily doctrinal. What is, I believe, doctrinal is that we are living creatures. And animals are living creatures. And we are all patterned after other living creatures. Spirit beings, which are called cherubim. Cherubim. All right. Uh, you'll find this in Ezekiel chapter 1, Ezekiel chapter 3, and Ezekiel chapter 10. All those places will have that phrase, living creatures, making one of the 23 found in the King James Bible. Now, go to uh, Romans chapter 8. We might come back to Ezekiel. Romans chapter 8. This is just a setup. <coughs> Romans chapter 8. Now, again, before you got saved, you were a dead creature. Amen. The Bible says... Uh, and ye hath he quickened who was dead trespasses and sins. Watch this here, ready? How spiritual I am. <laughs> Brother, I'm trying to preach. What are you doing? I got a face full of people looking at me like, what are you doing, preacher? <laughs> You're interrupting me. All right, well, I have you on speaker, so you just apologize to the whole church. How about that? <laughs> That's Pastor Dwayne Lord. So. Hi, Pastor. Everybody say hi to you. I'm waving at you. So we'll get back. All right, brother. All right, bye. Love you, man. Right. That's a blessing. Only the small church you can do that. Yeah. Can't do that Sunday morning. Well, listen. Everybody that is unsaved is a living creature in their in their body in their flesh, right? Yeah. But but something is wrong with them. An unsaved person, something is wrong with them. Yeah. They're, they're alive, bodily speaking. They are, they are alive in that they have a conscience. They are alive in that they can make decisions and they can choose Christ so their spirit isn't completely dead and void of being able to make decisions. But they, they are not where they're supposed to be yet. Because the fall of Adam has damned that, our human race in that they're not saved. They're not walking 
with God or in fellowship with God, something is missing in their life. What's missing? The Spirit of God is missing yeah, in their amen, life. Amen. So they are alive, but they're not living. Right. They're alive, but they're not living. The Bible says for me to live is Christ right. and to die is gain. In order to be that living creature that God wants you to be, you've got to be born again, which is why he says, and ye have the quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Every unsaved person is dead in their relationship to God. Is that right? Yep. But after you got saved, God quickened you. God made you alive. So what are you? You're a living creature in Christ. Look at Romans chapter 8, verse 18. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest, and I gave that to you in Philippians this morning. I didn't think to turn here, but... For the earnest expectation of what? Of the creature. The creature. See, your creature, your living creature, that soul inside of you that is connected to God now that you're saved, quickened by His Spirit, that living creature inside of you is waiting for the day when it can be set free from this body. Amen. That's what it desires. That living creature is trapped inside of your dead body. Now, your body's alive physically, but the flesh is of no value, it's of no use. It is a dead thing that God allows to carry him around in. Yeah. It's like the Ark of the Covenant. Wow. The box is just wood. Right? right? Yeah. Uh, the temple that they would break down and set up, just made of wood, yeah. shit of wood, and go for wood, and covered with badger skins, and covered with linen, and, and scarlet, and all that kind of stuff, and made of gold, yes, but it was just man-made things. Right. What was on the inside was yeah, God. Right. What was on the inside was God. And God allowed those things to carry him around. But the Bible says now he ain't made with things. He ain't made uh, or he ain't in, in things made with hands. Right. Now he's in a side of us. But he still allows this dead corpse of a body mm -hmm. to carry our living Savior around. It's a wild yeah, thought. Yeah. It really is. So we are a living creature on the inside. We're waiting for the day that God takes our soul and spirit Back to him. Verse 20. For the creature, that's the child of God, has been born again, the soul. The creature is made sub, was made subject. Watch that thing there. The creature was made subject to vanity. Not willingly. <laughs> but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. You know why you don't do the things you should do? It's because you are not naturally subject to the things of God. Right. And sometimes when it comes to doing what's right, you're doing it's done to you against your will because the soul inside of you is convicting you and driving you to do it. Your flesh don't want to do it. So the job of the Christian is to try to get their flesh, the thing that we got to carry around with us, to act upon the nature of the soul that is belongs to God. Yeah. You're trying to make this body do what it don't want to do. Right. What is it? Be subject to what the soul is driving you to do, which is to serve God. Yeah. And the living creature inside of you wants to serve God all the time. Mm -hmm. But the dead creature, the body, if you will, doesn't want to do it. Mm -hmm. So I have to bring this corpse, this dead body, into subjection to that living creature that was made subject to this dead body. It's a wild relationship. That's why it's hard for us to do the right thing all the time and to please God all the time. Yeah. Nevertheless, we know faith is what pleases God. Amen. As children of God, we've been created a new creature in Christ until the day He takes us home. As such, we are living creatures created in the image of God and living in the body and person of Jesus Christ. The life of the new creature comes with a plan and a purpose according to the Word of God. Go back to Genesis. According to Genesis, Romans, Corinthians, and Ezekiel, all new creatures are responsible for how they live. Okay? The life of the new creature comes with a plan and a purpose according to the Word of God. And we're going to see that in just a second. That the living new creature comes from God or comes by God with a plan. You know, God didn't drop you into this world without a plan. Amen. God's got a plan for your life. Amen. God had a plan for you to get saved. God made a way for you to get saved. God had a plan and a will for you to get saved. If you're saved tonight, 
You partook of his plan. Amen. You got in the way with Jesus Christ yes. and you got into the plan of God Amen. that began before the foundation of the world. Is that right? Yes. Okay, so now that I'm saved, don't you believe that God has a plan for your yes. life now that you're saved? Yes. That God has a purpose, a direction, a will for your life? You say, well, what's my plan? What's God's will? Amen. What's God's course? What's God's direction for my life? Amen. Well, there's some things I can't tell you what they are. Stay married or stay uh, uh, single your whole life. I couldn't tell you that for your, for sure. But there are some things that God gave every living creature. When they were made, God formed them, fashioned them with a plan and a purpose. And you'll find that here in Genesis chapter 1. In fact, you'll find it in Ezekiel, Genesis, Corinthians, and Romans. Number 1, Genesis chapter 1 verse 22. And see if you can't pick out the pattern. That's what we're looking at as a pattern for the new creature. Genesis 1.22. And God blessed them, saying what? And fill the waters and let the, let the fowl multiply in the earth. Look at verse 28. Let's see if there's not a similar command for the human creature as there was for the fish and fowl and beast and cattle creature. Ready? Verse 28. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, what? Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. Can I just say this? Here's God's plan for every living creature, including you. You ready? It's not hard. Be fruitful, multiply, fill, or replenish. That is the number one job based on the first mention of what God expects every living creature to do. He blesses you with salvation, doesn't he? Yes, amen. He blessed you, and God blessed you with his Son, and God blessed you with his Spirit, and God blessed you with his Word, and God blessed you with his person, and blessed you with the Bible, and blessed you upon blessings. Is that right? Yeah. So what do I do with all of God's blessings he's put into my life? You know what I do? I become fruitful with it. Yeah, amen. I multiply, and I fill or replenish, depending upon what we're talking about. Well, what's the number one thing i got to be fruitful with? You ready? Galatians 5. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, gentleness, meekness, faith, temperance, those nine things there. So the number one thing i got to be fruitful with is be fruitful with the fruit of the Spirit. I need in my life all nine characteristic traits of the Holy Spirit. See, if I've only got seven or eight of them, well, strive for the ninth. Amen. Because God didn't say, only be fruitful to a certain point. Okay. In fact, you don't see, fruitful just simply means be full of fruit. Right. Mm -hmm. Isn't that what it means? Yeah. Yeah. So what is our job? To be full of fruit. Mm -hmm. What kind of fruit? Love, yeah. joy, yeah. all nine there in Galatians chapter 5. Mm -hmm. um, then he says, the second command is what? Multiply. What does multiply mean? It means follow and make disciples. Mm -hmm. Follow Christ and then what? Multiply by making other disciples. Is that what it means? Yeah. If, if I'm going to multiply, how does that work? I can't multiply myself, right? I'm already being fruitful by walking in the Spirit, being filled with the Spirit, and having the Spirit manifest His characteristic in my life, all nine if, I, if the Lord allows, right? So what else do I have to do beyond just being fruitful? Multiply. How do I multiply? Make disciples. Yeah, amen. It is our responsibility to win others to Christ, making fruit that way as well, yeah. leading souls to Christ. Right? What do I do with the fruit that, that that God has produced in my life as a result of leading others to Christ? Make disciples of them. Yeah, amen. Train them up. Yeah. And the nurture and admission of the Lord. Hey, what do you think God meant when he told Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply and punish the earth? What do you think he was talking about there? Is that talking about having children? Yeah. Is that right? If, yeah. right? if God says, hey, Adam and Eve, I want you to be fruitful, what does that mean? It means to have children. So be fruitful, have children, multiply, more children. What does he want you to do? What do you want them to do with those children? Train them. Yes, Disciple them. Amen. Same thing when you lead someone to Christ. You know what we're supposed to do? Train them up. Yes, absolutely. How? In the nurture and vision of the Lord. Amen. So follow and make disciples. Didn't Paul say, be followers of me, even as I am of Christ? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Didn't God make disciples? Yes. And then what did he tell his disciples to do? Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Amen. He said, Jerusalem, Judea, 
Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. What is that? That's being fruitful and multiplying. Amen. And for 2,000 years we've been doing that. Number three, did he say be filled with the Spirit? Mm -hmm. Ephesians 5, he says, be filled with the Spirit. And Ephesians 5, 17. So what does he say? He says, be fruitful and multiply. And then in verse 22, what does he say? Fill the waters and the seas. You know what you need to be? You need to be filled with the Spirit. Amen. The question comes, how do I get filled with the Spirit? Colossians 3, 16. Let the Word of Christ, what? Dwell in you richly with all wisdom. Amen. While Ephesians 5 says, be filled with the Spirit. Right. And then he says, speaking to yourselves how? In psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. One of the ways I know I'm filled with the Spirit is I love the right kind of music. Amen. Okay? But in Colossians 3.16, he don't say be filled with the Spirit. It's parallel passages, Ephesians 5 and Colossians 3. But in Colossians 3, it's there saying be filled with the Spirit. You know what he says? Let the Word of Christ, what? Dwell in you. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you. So if you want to be filled with the Spirit, what do you have to be filled with? God's Word. God's Word, the Word of God. That's exactly right. So my job is to, number one, have the fruit of the Spirit. Number two, follow Christ, make disciples. Number three, be filled with the Spirit. But in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, he didn't say fill, did he? What does he say? It's a different word. They don't mean the same thing. Be fruitful and multiply in what? Replenish. replenish. In fact, plenish is a word. If you go back and look at look at old English, plenish was a word. Oh. Now, it's not a word that we use anymore, but plenish used to be a word in the English language. And plenish meant to fill. So replenish means to what? Refill. To refill. You know why? Sometimes you get dry. Amen. You know why you want to come to church? Because you get dry. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You might get filled up on Sunday, but by the time you get to next Sunday, what do you need? A replenishing, a refilling. And sometimes you need Wednesday in between that to kind of get you over the hump to stay filled. Is that right? Mm -hmm. So what does it mean to replenish? It means to restore a fallen brother or sister in Christ. Yeah. Or it means to have your walk with God restored if you're running a little dry. Look at Genesis chapter 9. That's the first command for living creatures. Multiply, be fruitful, fill, and replenish. That's every Christian's job. Every Christian's job is, is all of those, but sometimes you've got to focus more on one thing before you get to the other. All right, Genesis chapter 9. Here's the second thing that God desires for every living creature. Of course, all these living creatures are coming off the ark. Is that right? Yeah. In Genesis 9, they had the flood, and they were all crammed up on that ark for, you know, 370 days or whatever it was. And, uh, and uh, I think it's actually 378, but they, uh, they're they in the ark for all that amount of time there, and uh, you, get, you get kind of tired of each other after a while. Yeah. <laughs> You start to smell like one another, amen. So God says, you know what? You, you got to get off this ark, but I got some, some rules for you. I got a plan for you that I want you to carry out when you get off the ark. So what is the plan? Look at Genesis chapter 9. And when instead of reading the whole thing, he says, because uh, we already read it, he says, uh, verse 11, he says, I will establish my what? Covenant. covenant. Look at verse 12. And God said, this is the token of the what? Of the covenant. covenant. Verse 13. I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a what? Of the covenant. Verse 15. And I will, re and I will remember my, my what? Covenant. Which is between me and you, and every living creature of all flesh. Look at verse 16. And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it, that I may look at the word. Remember, remember what? The everlasting covenant, right? Look at verse 17. And God said to Noah, this is the token of the what? Of the covenant. So you know what the, the second thing is that every living creature needs to be aware of by way of God's plan for their life? Be mindful of God's promises. Amen. Number one, God wants you to be multiply. God wants you to multiply. 
God wants you to be filled. God wants you to re replenish. God wants you to help restore other brothers and sisters to Christ. You yourself being replenished day by day. But beyond that, God wants you to be mindful of His promises. Now I know that Noah's promise is different than our promise. I understand that. In the sense that he's not talking about Noah's salvation here. I understand that. Nevertheless, what you see is that God made an everlasting covenant with Noah. And I don't know about you, but I don't know of any other worldwide floods like Noah's flood. <laughs> any of y'all ever heard of one? Mm -hmm. No, they don't even believe the one that took place the first time. Yeah, yeah. But God told Noah, listen, Noah, I'm going to make a covenant with you, and I will remember this covenant. Well, why was God saying, I'm going to remember? Because you know what man is prone to do? Forget. Yeah, yeah. The living creature is prone to forget the promises that God has made to him. Mm -hmm. But as a Christian, as a living creature in the New Testament that was made in Christ's blood, can I tell you this? He's made a covenant with you or a promise with you that he will not break. Amen. Any more that God will, would break his covenant with Abraham and Isaac or Jacob, any more that God would break his covenant with, uh, with David, or that God would break his covenant with Noah, or that God would break his covenant with the future nation of Israel. Can I just tell you this? God will not break his promises with you. Amen. So what do you need to be as a Christian? Mindful of his promises. What are some of the promises that God has made? Look at uh, Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1. It's very easy to become forgetful. Yes. How long do you think it was between the time that Noah got off the ark and that Noah got drunk on wine? I don't know. I really don't know. Maybe the answer is there. I don't know. But it shows you that even some of the greatest experience, would you say there would be a greater experience in Noah's life the day that God saved him from drowning in his family? You know what I mean? Like, a hundred years you're building a boat as large as it was. And you get to see the thing completed, but it wasn't worth building unless the rains began to fall. And unless the waters began to rise. And unless God did do what He said He was going to do, which was drown out. Otherwise, no one would look foolish. And God would look foolish, wouldn't He? So, would you probably say there wasn't a greater day in Noah's life than the day the Lord closed the door of the ark and sent him off on a journey that lasted as long as it lasted and they were in the ark as long as it lasted and wouldn't you think if you went through that you might never forget <laughs> but I'm going to tell you that you've been in Christ longer possibly than they were in the ark they were in the ark about a year and a month or so two months something like that most of y'all have been saved longer than that yeah is that right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You've been in the ark. You've been in Christ longer than they were in the ark. What's our reason for forgetting yeah, where we are? Mm -hmm. We get on Noah for getting drunk, but how many Christians? Yeah. Yeah. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. And it's like that. It's been like that for a long time. It was like that with, with Jesus and his disciples. Mm -hmm. He told them, here's what you're going to do. Yeah. Like, we would never do that. Oh, yeah. And they ended up doing it. <laughs> They saw the miracles. They saw the, you know, they said, well, if only Jesus would show me his, listen, God has done all that and more. Yeah, amen. And we are not faithful to remember yeah, yeah. all that he's done. Yeah. We'd like to think we would never go back and do the things that we said we would no longer do because of how much God has blessed us and done good in our life. And yet we sometimes find ourselves yeah. back where we were. You know how you can get out of that if you fall back there? Be mindful. Amen. Remember what the Word of God has promised. Titus chapter 1, look at verse number 2. <coughs> Titus 1, 2. He says, In hope of eternal life, which God, what? That can not lie, promised before the world began. Amen. Before the world even began, God made promises that He would not go back on. What a blessing, what a privilege Amen. to serve a God that cannot lie, Amen. that cannot go back on His Word. Look at 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. And we sometimes are too quick to forget 
All the promises that God has made toward us. 1 John chapter 2, verse 25. Here's a great promise. 1 John 2, 25. And this is the what? Promise. promise that He hath promised us. Even what? Eternal life. God has promised you eternal life. Amen. Which means you have a life that is far greater than the life you're living right Amen. now. I mean, my life ain't so great. I got a good life, but it ain't so great stacked up to that life. Right. Eternal life with God in a perfect place forever. You can't beat that. No. And so how do I get my how do I get this living creature to think like a living creature should think? Yeah. I gotta think about the promises yeah, yeah. that God has made me. Yeah, yeah. Otherwise I become forgetful and I'm no more better than those that never made it onto the ark. Yeah. I'm drowned in self-pity. I'm drowned in, in loathing. I'm drowned in, in fears and regrets. I'm drowned in my past failures and mistakes rather than what? Looking unto Jesus. Yeah, rather than setting my affections on things. Of, you know that you will never go anywhere with God in the future if you never learn to forget the past. Yes. Yeah. If you keep going back to the past and dragging up old memories yeah. and dragging up old friends and old acquaintances and old sins, you will never serve God to the fullest capacity that He has planned for your Christian life. Yeah. Why? Because you keep going back before the ark. Yeah. You are not before the ark. You are after the ark. Amen. You are a living creature who's made it in Christ. Amen. And if you're going to go anywhere in this world for God, it's going to come because you don't look back. No, amen. The old song I wanted to think, talk about it this morning. I have decided what? No what? Looking no looking back, no turning back, no turning back. Though all the world forsake thee, still I will what? Follow no turning back. You know why Lot's wife turned to a pillar of salt? Hey, you want a real Christian oh, principle? Yeah. You ready? A good way to go nowhere is to look back. Oh, amen. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. she was turned into a what? Pillar a pillar of salt. salt. Right. Which means she was frozen in time. Yeah. You know how many Christians are frozen in their Christian walk? Yeah. Frozen in time because they keep looking back at the would ofs or the should ofs or the I could ofs that's the devil there tempting you to look back at all the things that you could have done or should have done or would have done but you didn't do you will be frozen in time spiritually speaking yeah, amen. and that's what the devil wants he wants yeah. to stop you from moving forward that's right. you got to press forward press onward mm -hmm. press up press on the upward way New heights I'm gaining every day. Listen, can I bring it back to this for a second? You will never get here if you're always looking back here. And you'll never get saved if you're worried about what here is thinking about you or saying about you. Well, if I get saved, I'll lose all my friends. You know why people don't get saved? They're looking at all the things that are here in a big old lake of fire. So they never even get saved. But they'll never get to this level if they're afraid of what they'll lose if they begin to serve God and live for Christ. And you'll never get to here if you think, well, I don't want to have to do much more than I'm already doing. That's the levels of Christianity. Level one, level two, level three. Level one is getting saved. Level two is learning some things about the Bible. Level three is training others things yeah, from the Bible. You becoming a disciple yourself, discipling others. Amen? Amen. But a lot of people don't want to go there because they are frozen as a pillar of salt in time. Look at uh, Luke 21. Here's a great promise. Luke 21. Luke 21. Luke 21, verse 33. Sometimes I don't need to dovetail these things, but the Lord knows... What he's doing, Luke uh, 21, 33. Heaven and earth shall pass away. That's like Noah's flood, right? Okay. <laughs> shall pass away. But my what? My words. Words shall not pass away. You know what that is? That's a promise. Amen. That's a, dare I say, covenant that God has made 
two believers <laughs> pertaining to his word. My words will not pass away. In other words, that rainbow is an everlasting covenant. This book is an everlasting covenant Amen. that he cannot go back on. Amen. What a blessing Amen. that we have. And uh, look at 2 Peter real quick. 2 Peter chapter 3. I won't take you through all the promises, just these. 2 Peter 3. Then I'll give you the last one, then we'll go home for the day. I, I wish I could get Christians to understand they will never go anywhere in life if they are constantly hanging on to the past. Yeah, amen. They just won't go anywhere. They're, they're yeah. stuck in sand. They're stuck in yeah. time. And that's not the way that God, God says, follow me. Yeah. And I will make you fishes of men. Amen. See, amen. if you don't ever take the first step of following him, you can't take the next step of what? Making you into a fisher of other men. Those are the stages of growth in the Christian life. These are the things that God desires for living creatures. Saved individuals. Uh, 2 Peter 3.13, the Bible says this. 2 Peter 3.13, Nevertheless, we, according to what? Look for what? New heavens and new earth. Is that like? Heaven and earth shall pass away, yes. but my words shall never pass away. Isn't that like Noah's ark? Hey, the world was drowned out in a flood, but I'm going to take you on to a better and new world. Ain't that right? Yes. He says, we're going to look for a new heavens and a new earth where dwell righteousness. Can I tell you what you have coming to you one day? A new place. A new home in glory where your name is written down. And what will you find there? It is the promise of eternal righteousness. No sorrow, no suffering, no sickness, Amen. no pain. Hey, look at that. No looking back. There is no looking back. When you get out of this world, in Galatians 1, He died delivered us from this present evil world. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, comfort one another by these words. When we ascend into heaven with a shout, with the voice of God, the archangel, and the trumpet of God shall sound, and we shed this mortal body, and we are quickened into fashion after His image and His likeness, and glorified His presence. Hey, don't you know that you'll not have one regret for when you get saved? Yeah. At the judgment seat of Christ, you'll have no regrets for serving God, for, for going the distance, for going the extra mile, for going the second mile, for pushing through hard times, for pushing through difficult times, for not giving up, for not quitting, for standing your ground, for taking a stand, for holding fast till he comes. Amen. Don't you know you will not have one second of regret Amen. at the judgment seat of Christ? Why? It's a promise of eternal righteousness. No more of this political nonsense. Oh, yeah. No more of this, you know, uh, 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 you know, modern approach to life. No man, it's gonna be a sweet time in heaven. Yeah. Go to Ezekiel chapter one. Let me give you the last one. I can start to preach here. <laughs> Ezekiel chapter one. I uh, mean, you're a living creature, and God made living creatures, and God made living creatures with a plan. He had a purpose for their life. Yeah. And God has a plan, and He has a purpose for your life. Now, where you go with that is totally up to you. Right. We're talking to the church this morning. You can't make anybody do anything. Yeah. And if you did, it wouldn't last in their life. You have to make the decision to go with God. Amen. And you will only go as far as, as you will go so long as you stay in control of your life. Definitely. But if you'll surrender and turn yourself over to God and say, not my will, but I will follow you and you can make out of me whatever you want, then you will go places in your Christian life. Amen. And you'll be hated along the way for it. That's right. But at least you know it's where God wants that's his plan. Multiply. Fruitfulness. Fill. Replenish. Be mindful. But lastly, Ezekiel chapter 1 verse 20. Whithersoever the Spirit was to go, they what? Went. They went. Mm -hmm. Thither was their Spirit to go. Um, and the wheels were lifted up over against them for the Spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. I have no idea what that means, but I know it means something good. <laughs> Verse 21. When those went, the wheels, I guess, these went, the living creatures. And when those stood, these stood. 
And when those, man, this gets exciting. And when those were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up over against them. For the spirit of the living creature was what? In the, in the wheels. wheels. Uh, the other day, Michael was running the bases. I just thought about this, buddy. The other day, Michael was running the bases. And he ran the bases in uh, 14 seconds all the way around from home back to home. And they gave him a nickname. They called him Wheels. Oh, <laughs> they called him Wheels with a Z on the end. Yay. Real cool. Wheels. I love it. Hey, you know what Christians are supposed to be? Wheels. Keep on moving. Yeah. Keep on moving. <laughs> Christians are supposed to be wheels. We ain't supposed to be stuck in the mud. Uh, Maris was called a gazelle because she's the light of foot and she ran. She made it in 12 seconds. Oh, but, uh, oh. but, yeah, no, she, <laughs> <laughs> competition's good. Yeah. Well, listen, wheels, what is it? It's motivation. It's moving. It's not being in a rut. It's not standing still. Didn't he say, hey, ye men of Galilee, why stand you here gazing? Yeah. Then the Lord says, I must be about my father's business. Hey, as Christians, we are to be mm -hmm. wheels in God's automobile. Hallelujah, preacher. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> That's what we're supposed to be. Yeah. We are supposed to be the thing that keeps this whole thing moving. Yeah. There's an old saying down south, let the church what? Roll on. No, amen. Though the world forsake us, though the world turn their back on us, though our own brothers and sisters turn their back on us, let the church roll on. Yeah. What does that say? We're going to keep going. We're going to keep moving. We're going to keep rolling for Christ. Amen. How are we supposed to be moved? By the Spirit of God. Amen. So the first responsibility for the living creature is to multiply for M purposes. Multiply. Secondly, be mindful. Number three, be moving. Be moving by the Spirit of God. Let me just say this. If we are filled with the Spirit of God, then we will move by the Spirit of God. Amen. If we are filled with man, then we will be moved by man. If we are filled with the flesh, then we will be moved by the flesh. What will, quickly, what will being filled with the Spirit look like? Look at verse 13. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire and like the appearance of what? Lance. You know what being filled with the Spirit will cause? It will cause your light to shine. Mm -hmm. Light to shine. Number two, look at verse 14. And the living creatures did what? Ran. They ran. And returned as the appearance of a flash of what? Lightning. You know what being filled with the Spirit will cause you to do, number two? It will cause you to sprint. So we're going to shine. We're going to sprint. These are all S's, Daddy. We're going to sprint. I learned from you. Look at verse 23. And under the... So what are you going to do, Christian? You're going to let your light so shine before men that may glorify your Father which is in heaven. Is that right? Yes. Holding forth the word of life. Is that right? Yes. So if you're going to be filled with the Spirit, Christian, if you're going to be moved right to do anything for God, it'll cause your light to shine. It'll cause you to sprint because you're running in a race to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Number three, verse 23. Under the firmament were their wings straight. You know what it'll do, Christian? It'll be filled with the Spirit. Yeah. It'll keep you straight. Yeah, amen. Straight on your doctrine. Yeah. Straight on the book. Yeah. Straight on what's right and what's wrong. Yeah. It'll not make you crooked. Yeah. You'll be an honest, hardworking individual yeah. serving the Lord. Amen. Number, number four, it'll cause you to be straight. Verse uh, 23 again. Uh, the one... He said, under the firmament were the wings straight, the one toward the other. Everyone had two, which covered on this side, and everyone had two, which covered on that side, their bodies. You know what it'll make you do? It'll make you stand. Amen. It'll make you stand. Stand for what? Stand for what is right. right. Stand for what is true. Mm -hmm. Hey, you know what it'll do? It'll cause you to stand with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Mm -hmm. you, know what these, you know what these chairs are doing? Yeah. They're standing... Every one of them had two, and they're standing, and they're standing what? The one toward the other. You'll stand, you'll be straight, you'll be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And know what you're going to do? You're going to have the same spirit one toward another. Amen. Look at that thing there. It says they stood st standing straight, and the one toward the other. We're not going to be divided. Amen. We're not going to be against Amen. each other. Amen. We're not going to pick fights with each other. Amen. We're not going to belittle or besmirch or put down one another. We're not going to thumb up our nose. We're not going to 
think ourselves to be something special or because we have standards that somebody else doesn't have, we are somehow superior in intellect, intelligence, or spirituality just to cause a rift or divide the body of Christ. Amen. We're not going to do that. Amen. If you're filled with the Spirit, yeah. you won't do that. I don't know what number I'm on. I've, I've lost track. Look at chapter 3. Chapter 3, I'm almost done, I promise. Chapter 3. I think this is like the sixth one. Yep. Verse 13, Ezekiel 3.13. What will, what will be think, being filled with the Spirit cause you to do? Ezekiel 3.13. This really fits with this morning's sermon. Ezekiel 3.13. I heard also the noise of the wings of the living creatures. Look at this. That touched one another. That's not in my notes, but you know what you're going to do? You're going to touch one. Oh, sensitive. Amen. You'll be sensitive. Amen. You'll be sensitive. You'll be touched by the feeling of others' infirmities. Yeah. You know what it'll cause you to do? It'll cause you to pray. Mm -hmm. yeah. Listen, you know what we're trying to, you know to do? I'm trying to foster in you on Sunday nights is how to pray for one another. Mm -hmm. I, don't care about, I don't care about praying for the politics and praying for the world and praying for what's going on out there. Prayer time is a time to pray for one another. Amen. You want to pray for the politics, you want to pray for the president, do that on your own time. When you're here praying, you pray for one another. You get a hold of each other. You get a, you take each other by the hand, by the knee, by the back, uh, in, 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 in thoughtful uh, prayer as you pray for one another. Amen. Why? Because that's what matters. Amen. Be sensitive if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you'll be sensitive to each other's needs. I don't know why I said all that, because that wasn't in the notes, but there you go. Uh, what verse am I even on? 13, 13. chapter 3. Yep. I heard also the noise of living creatures that touch one another. You should be touched by the feeling of others' infirmities. And the noise of the wheels over against them, and a noise of a great rushing. You know what you're going to do? You're going to sound like a Christian. Amen. You're going to sound like God. You know what you do? You're going to speak out as I gave you this morning. Mm -hmm. You're going to hear the Word of God. You're going to be taught the Word of God. You're going to be fed the Word of God. And it's going to come out of your mouth. You're going to testify. You're going to preach. You're going to praise. You're going to give thanks. You're going to pray for one another. You are going to open your mouth yes. Amen. for God if you're filled with the Spirit because you have something to say that honors and pleases God. Listen, every time we open our mouths, it should not be to talk about what the world is doing or Amen. what the politics are doing Amen. or what this church is doing or that church is doing. I know it creeps in. I know it comes in. I know there's a time and a place for it. But more often than not, we need to be saying things that honor and glorify and exhort God Amen. and exhort one another. Amen. Amen. That's what we need. We need to sound like Christians. Amen. Amen. Speak the word. And lastly, Ezekiel chapter 10. There's three places, three chapters in Ezekiel about the living creatures. Chapter 1, chapter 3, and chapter 10. Body, soul, spirit, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Ezekiel chapter 10, verse 20. Now I like this. Watch this now. This is the living creature that I saw under the God of Israel by the river Chabar. And I knew that they were the cherubims. Mm. You know, Christian, if you're filled with the Spirit, people are going to know who you are. Oh, amen. You ain't got to worry about wearing the t-shirt. <laughs> wearing amen. the bumper sticker. Yeah, yeah. And showing off who you are. Let anybody know yeah. who you are. Amen. Listen, you just be filled with the Holy Spirit. You amen. say things that are timely. You say things that are fitting. You say things that are touching. People will know who you are. Yes. But you know the reason why people don't behave that way? is the last point. You ready? Yeah. To be filled with the Spirit? Watch what it says. This is the living creature that I saw where? Under the God. Where? Under the God. You know, lastly, if you're filled with the Spirit, you'll be in subjection. Mm. Yeah. That's what I preached about this morning, isn't it? Right. A little bit. You'll be in subjection. Everybody needs to be under somebody. Yeah. 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 You get these mavericks that don't want to be under anybody. Yeah. And you have rebellion on your hands. Not the rebellion that far down with this nation, the word of God, I understand that. I'm talking about the kind of rebellion that you can't be told uh -huh. yeah. what the Bible says. Yeah. You know, I heard a great quote this week. God will never put you over anybody if you can't learn to be under somebody. That's right. Mm. Yeah. 
Do you know that everybody's under somebody? You know that? You know that Jesus Christ is even under God the Father? Now, there's no way that God the Father is subject to understand that except to his own personage, his own holiness and righteousness. But you'll never go anywhere in life for God if you aren't filled with the Spirit. And one of the ways you'll know if you're filled with the Spirit is you are subject to authority. You live in subjection to authority, the Word of God. Yeah. You know what the problem with the culture today? Yeah. No, no authority. No. Yeah. I mean, not that there isn't any authority. They won't yield or submit themselves yeah. to. The Bible says, submitting yourselves under the mighty hand of God. Amen. That He may exalt you in due time. If you want to be filled with the Spirit, learn to be in subject. Yeah. Even Jesus Christ had to be subject on earth right. to His mother and His father. Amen. Amen. I got part of that message this morning was about being in subject, and I'll say that for another time. Let's pray. Uh, Dad, would you dismiss us? Oh, yeah.